I gave up on the journey of finding a Mike Hall in New York. I'd even settle for a Mike Lobby. Said that for sure. You did say that. <laughs> I love that so much. Oh my gosh, me and you are really corny. Yep, that was Taylor Rooks, and this is On the Bench with Mike Hall. That's me. I'm sure you've worked with someone where very early on, you just got a feeling that person's going to do big things. For me, no one exemplifies that more than Taylor Rooks. Though she grew up in Georgia, she's a Big Ten grad with a degree from the University of Illinois, the same school where her dad used to play football. Deep athletic ties in her family as baseball legend Lou Brock was her uncle. But in 2014, fresh out of Champaign, she joined the Big Ten Network as a studio host, focusing mostly on social media aspects of the Big Ten. She was raw at first, but got better every day. Asked questions, had no ego, worked her tail off. She was amazing at building relationships with people she covered. Sometimes in show meetings, we'd talk about someone who was having a great season, and 10 minutes later, she'd come up to me and say, I just texted with him and he said he'd be happy to come on and talk to you. Yep, she'd set up interviews for someone else using her own contacts. After just two years with us, New York City came calling as she got a full-time job at SNY, where she starred as a studio and podcast host. It didn't take long for a national outlet to hire her. She's flourishing right now, hosting and reporting for Turner Sports, while also fronting her own interview show, Take It There with Taylor Rooks on Bleacher Report. This past fall, not long after reporting inside the NBA bubble, the New York Times wrote a profile on her. She's still in her 20s. I couldn't have more pride in Taylor. Professionally, her interviews have earned praise for being inquisitive and sincere when it's time to be serious, and joyful and relatable when it's time to have fun. Personally, She's the type of person who sends you notes to say happy Father's Day after your first child was born. Now, before we start, you have to know a longtime staple of the Big Ten Network is our makeup artist, Shakita, the most beloved woman at our network who only says nice things and whom Taylor and I both adore. So I started off with Taylor by telling her I talked to Shakita and Shakita said to quote, tell Taylor I always liked Mike more. <laughs> Well, you know, she is known for her lies, so. <laughs> no, she's not. No, she's not. But that might be a slight lie. Was there anyone, let's be honest, was there anyone more important when you were at Big Ten Network than Shakita? No, like she is everything rolled into one. She does makeup, hair, therapy. She'll also just like eat lunch and dinner with you and good conversation. Like she wears every single hat that is possible. And like, I just, I miss her so much. I don't know how Big T Network would run if she wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, she's pretty great. Yeah. How would you, when you look back at your time on BT, how do you summarize it? Oh my gosh, I think I summarize it as just the best learning experience that you could ever ask for. You know, like I obviously went to University of Illinois, so I was already around Big Ten sports. And then to be lucky enough for your first job to still be the thing that you, you know, grew up loving, you were already covering. It was just kind of the perfect, it was the perfect opportunity for me. And it was really just like the perfect storm. I barely had to move. I just went from Champaign to Chicago. I was still covering all the things that I loved. I was able to make mistakes, learn from them, learn from so many great people that were there. I just could have asked for a better thing to do. And when I look back on it, sometimes I'm like, Q was actually kind of insane because he let a 21 year old be on live TV for five days a week who had never done it before, <laughs> but he's the best for, I just, you know, just believing in me and giving me that opportunity. But I look back on it and I'm like, he is insane for letting me do that. <laughs> so, so tell me more about that. So Q is yeah. Quentin Carter, who's been at BTN from day one. How did, how did he come into your life? How did Big Ten Network come into your life? Yeah. So... I don't even know. So when I was in college, I did BTN Student U, which is where they let students do a basketball game. There's a sign on reporter, a color commentator, and an analyst. Um, and so we do like a exhibition game and then it actually airs, you know, for people to watch. So I had done a couple of those, but one of the times I was there, there was 
a camera operator whose name was Clem. And he was always like, you're really good at this. Like you need to be in contact with the people that are there. You know, I'm just like, oh, well, thank you, whatever. Didn't think he was really gonna tell anybody about me. Turns out he like told Q that he needed to watch my broadcast and like watch my reel. So then Q reached out and was like, send me your stuff. And then I, he asked me to do like a couple of real reports in Iowa and Illinois. And then May came around, I had no job. June, still no job. July, still no job. Then Q in Q fashion randomly calls and is like, hey, we have this position and I really like you to fill it. I'm like, okay. And then I started the Big Ten Network. So, so much of it was just stuff that I was doing in college. And he just literally randomly called me. I was about to move back home because I had no job. He right. was like, can you work for us? I'm like, uh, yeah. I didn't ask anything. I wasn't asked, how much is it? When I was just like, yes, <laughs> I accept. Bring right. me in. <laughs> what you didn't know was he hired you to be a janitor. And yes. then it turns out that position got filled by the time you got there. Somehow, some way. Yeah. And then he said, okay, we don't need a janitor. So would you like to be on TV? And I just accepted. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you never know. Think of how good you could have been. That <laughs> yes, other person. Exactly. How did, how did U of I come to your, so you're in Georgia. How do you decide I'm going to Champaign? Is it just because your dad went there? Yeah, it was like, okay, both my parents went there, either go there or I get kicked out. So <laughs> I was like, uh, I'll go to Champaign. I'll go anywhere soon. It's funny because growing up, I would always hear them talk about like this called Champagne. And I always thought they were talking about the alcohol. Right. Like, what is Champagne? And then when I got older, I was like, oh, the city the school is in is Champagne. But I had heard so much about it and like seen so many football and basketball games that it was all very, it felt like home to me. And like when I went on my, I don't even know if it's like an official visit when you're not an athlete. It's, I don't know why I call it that. But when I went on my official visit to the school and I was <laughs> trying to figure out if I wanted to go, it was instant. I was like, I'm going to go. And keep in mind, I went when it was snow on the ground. It was super cold. Enough for anybody to say, why the hell are you leaving the South? But I just knew like that that's where I was supposed to be. It just felt like home? Yeah, it did. But I think a lot of it is just because I had heard so much about it. Right. You know, like I grew up knowing what University of Illinois was. And my dad also gave me like the coolest first time there. We like sat in the suite at the football game and I like met all the coaches and I was like, wow, this is so much fun. So it was it was meant to be. So we have something in common in that both my parents went to Illinois too. So yeah. when I grew up, it, it would, you know, like once a year, we'd go to a football game or we'd go to a basketball game. And that was sort of my introduction to not just the Big Ten, but to college sports in general. But I but, still wonder how two smart people who went to Illinois could create a human who would choose to go to Mizzou. It's very yeah. weird, See, but go ahead. <laughs> We were having a nice chat. Yeah, I just, I don't, I just am curious because they're clearly like superior beings because they went to Illinois, but I just don't know what went wrong that you decided that you weren't going to do that. But they did raise you well enough to know you should marry someone. <laughs> so they, they did that. <laughs> that right. They did that right. They had a couple, listen, those couple times when they dropped me on my head as a baby, yes. <laughs> that affected certain things, but the rest of the environment they raised me in. Everything else, good. Thank you. That's very sweet. You're a lovely lady. Um, <laughs> so what I was going to say before I got rudely interrupted was that my dad would always be like, not only are we going to the basketball game or the football game, but we're going to Garcia's. That was his thing. He was always like, we're getting these rectangle slices of pizza at Garcia's. And by the time I was in like high school, Garcia's had kind of, there used to be like three or four of them in Champaign. Now there was like only one. And yeah, it kind of made him a little sad. I'm curious, A, when you go back, what is your place or places that you go to? And B, mm -hmm. has have you been back? Because by the time I was only a few years out of college, it was like, this place is different. There's yes. so much that has changed. Yes. Well, first, I don't think that there was a Garcia's when I was there. I don't think I've heard of that. Wow. Um, I wish because I love some good pizza, but no, when I go back, I always go to Cofusion. I have to get the sushi at Cofusion. I always go to Maze, which is to this day, the best taco I have ever had. If you haven't <laughs> been to Maze, go next time you have to go to Champagne. Um, but those are, those are my two spots I have to go to. I went back for homecoming. And since it was homecoming, I was like, okay, I have to go to camps. So I went to camps. Uh, I went to, there's also like 
this weird new bar that wasn't there when I was there that I guess is the new cool spot. Cause when I was there, it was like, you go to cams. That was just it. Uh, and it's really cool because now, you know, so they tore down cams and moved it, but where cams was, there's like a mural there now. And I'm in the mural, which is really? like, yes, when COVID is over, I have to go back and see it. Cause I was like, that's really, really cool because man, oh man, I had some nights in cams. But uh, but yes, those are my like. That's where I I have to go cams uh, and all those. But it looks so different. Like there's like a Target and like all of these really cool city things in Champagne now. The kids have much more options than, than I have when I was there. So they made a mural of people who got kicked out of cams. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yes. No, no, no. They made a mural of people who were banned from camp. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay. So Illinois is in your blood and then you go there. So it's tied to you forever. Mm -hmm. Give me like the, the sports fan Illini moments. Like, I think I remember you telling me you were at the Tyler Griffey. Yes, I was. Brandon Paul yeah. threw it to me. He it in. We beat Indiana. It's so funny because so I was in the bubble and so I would always see Victor and like almost every single time we saw each other we'd bring it up and like I have I did these vlogs and I was in the bubble and our my like video person caught one of the times and he's like listen she thinks that Illinois is better than Indiana because they beat us one time <laughs> meanwhile Illinois stole the name of our arena we're the real assembly halls like well we're also not even assembly hall anymore but whatever but yes that is like the highlight of my of my sports time in Illinois because Honestly, I wasn't really there when either team was really good. I didn't see like very high years. You know, my freshman year it was like Myers, Leonard, Brandon Paul. Myers is like the last person who's like in the NBA. I mean, Kendrick Nunn as well. Um, but I didn't have these crazy, crazy good years when I was in school there, especially not with the football team. Right. Um, but yeah, basketball wasn't outstanding or anything. Uh, have you been to a Bragging Rights game? No. Whoa, no. Taylor. I know. I know. Got when, to go. When when everything ends and normalcy is back, I mean, I'm telling you, it is. I tell people who aren't even Missouri or Illinois fans, it is yeah. one of the best sporting events you'll ever go to. It oh. is. I it love is, watching it, so I know I love like actually actually being there. It is so cool the way it's split in half and like the my favorite. This so. No, it's not dumb. It's cool. My favorite thing when you're at there is the cheerleaders do the 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 liberty pose, where uh, a male cheerleader holds up a, a female cheerleader by just their uh, feet. Yeah. And there's like four on Illinois and four on Missouri, and like they see which school can hold it the longest, and like the place goes insane. <laughs> In this, it's like the under eight timeout of the first half, and it's like. You wouldn't believe how much there's 22,000 people or whatever screaming their faces off. Yeah, like that's the real competition. Yes. Okay, wait, so of the times that you've been, I know you probably don't know the exact number, but wh who would you say wins that more? The Illinois cheerleaders or the Mizzou cheerleaders? Oh, I thought you were going to say, because the basketball game, it's very frequently Illinois. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's very frequently <laughs> Illinois, but the cheerleaders, this is where you can get us. <laughs> you, you might have the edge. We might, the Missouri, the Missouri chillers might have the edge on that. Yeah. But that's what counts. That's what counts. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Do you have a, a, a favorite Illinois athlete, either from when you were a kid or now? As mm, that's a good one. I mean, I would say like Kid D. Brown. Yeah. Um, like that's one of the Illinois basketball games I vividly remember watching was when we beat Arizona. Oh. In Elite that's like, I remember that. Um, so probably D. Brown. I'm trying to think who my favorite football player would be from there i don't know like i mean honestly I your always... dad oh yeah i guess he's cool too <laughs> my dad i guess yeah <laughs> my dad like howard griffin uh yeah all these all these guys but i was gonna say i i don't know what i've always loved riley o'toole i know he wasn't like some crazy like big star but he is just like this the sweetest human uh so i think I'm, i might say riley o'toole he was great. great mikey dudek actually i love mikey dudek how good was he and so a... good i hate that like all these injuries happen in because he was so good and just a good human so i'd say mikey dudek as well isn't that the most the most empty, heartbreaking feeling in sports 
is when someone gets injured and then if they get injured again, what, what happened to Dudek or what happened to Robbie Hummel or what happened to like, when you see these guys and it's just so unfair and it like, yeah. it crushes you and you're not even the person who's getting injured. Right, you're, it's so unfair and you're just thinking like, we didn't even get to see where they went. You know, it's like, it's like the injury like robs you of your dream and like robs you of your potential, which is just like super, super heartbreaking. Um, but Mikey was, Mikey was so, so good. He and I just, great. I wish we were able to, you know, see it continue. Right. Yeah, he was great. Um, all right, let me, you know, one of my things that I love about you is you're not afraid to be a nerd. Um, <laughs> especially when it comes to jokes. So I want to play a game with you. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Let's right. go. This game is called Taylor Texts, true or false. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read you something and you'll tell me which of the things are actual text messages Taylor Rook sent to me and which ones I made up. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, ready? Here's one. Okay. Carrot cake is healthy because it's carrots. I definitely said that. You definitely said I that. I definitely said that because I actually like kind of believe that. Like, I don't even know if I think that was a joke. Like, I kind of believe it. So I know that was me. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Carrot cake is healthier than vanilla cake. Like, I mean, so it's, uh, it's kind of true. It's, it's kind of true. It's hard to believe you don't have a medical degree. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how. <laughs> Number two, when you were out sick one day, quote, sometimes you're so cool, you get a cold. I can picture myself saying that. However, I don't think I did. You definitely did. <laughs> Absolutely sent it. I have the proof. When did I say that? Back in like 2016, it was oh, like. Oh, that is, you know. My humor has evolved since then. <laughs> I would have made the cool joke even better. So I just didn't even know that comedian, but that was funny. Okay, so, okay, I said that. One more. This One is more. so funny, okay. <clears throat> Quote, I gave up on the journey of finding a Mike Hall in New York. I'd even settle for a Mike Lobby. <laughs> said that for sure. You did say that. <laughs> I love that so much. Oh my gosh, me and you are really corny, but it's yes. great. Yes, or so you. Um, but yes, there's there's some back and forth there. What do, you, what do you attribute? Like, clearly you have an ability to make good relationships with the people you work with, but why do you think you've had such success with athletes? Yeah, you know, I think that it's because I really try to interview people like they're my friends. Like I try to talk to people like they're my friends, like the same way I would talk to, I don't know, Le LeBron James, the same way that I would talk to like in like my best friend. And I think that the more you say like super organic and have conversations that aren't just based in the sport, the more they want to talk to you. I think, I think through time I've realized that they know when you're not being an authentic person um, and they tend to want to, you know, do interviews and like give scoops and stuff to people that they think are like they care about them on a human level and they are actually like real people. I yeah. also think and I always tell people this, I think that my age helps as well. I also think that being at the Big Ten Network helps. I was able to see so many people become who they are now. And so a lot of them are very familiar because they were watching me then, you know, like even when I was in the bubble, I saw Duncan Robinson and I had never really like spoken him except once at the, at the Big Ten. And I'm sitting in the lobby and he like comes up and he's like, you know, like I used to watch you on Big Ten Network. Like it's so cool. I like, see you in the bubble. Like, and then I would interview Duncan sometimes in the bubble just off that. So I think there's a familiarity and for a lot of these guys like we're the same age so there's like a relatability as well uh that i think has really helped but i will say there's <clears throat> there's multiple things that you have to deal with that i don't have to yeah uh, your gender is different your skin color is different mm -hmm. let me ask about the gender first how do you balance wanting to build a relationship and a bond yeah. with someone but making it clear 
we're not crossing any lines here because right. that's something I don't have never had to deal with. And I bet you have to deal with on a weekly basis. Yeah, all the time. But the thing that I have realized, like it's not the, it's not the this realizing that we're not crossing any lines. It's like me to fans and commenters and like tweeters. Really? Like it's, I think it's, it's very clear to the people that I'm interviewing. It's not clear to the peanut gallery. You know, everybody, it's so weird. Like I'll be sitting and interviewing somebody and people are like, oh, they're dating. I'm like, well, <laughs> because we did an interview. Like there's no rhyme or reason to it at all. But, but it's like, oh, the, literally every interview that I have ever done, someone said it in a comment. Like it's the craziest thing. So I think that through time, I've just realized like, why would it matter what somebody who doesn't know me nor this person say? Like, why would what they say even like matters? And I think that through time, like, Ahmad Rashad made an entire career off being friends with athletes. You even see somebody like Chris Haynes, who gets a lot of his scoops and stuff off of being friends with athletes, but nobody bats an eye, right? Like nobody said, oh my God, is Ahmad Rashad dating Michael Jordan? Like nobody <laughs> said that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not even something that they that they think about. But I think that for whatever reason, there's this very weird and false idea that women in this space like athletes are like your kryptonite and you have to date them it's it's super super weird to think that we'd be dating every single person that we've talked to right. um but yeah like it's, it's really not with the it's not the interviewer interviewee where you're really trying to make that known it's it's with everybody else i would maybe this is ignorant but i i think it's better that way than the inverse right because in the one yeah. hand you you can kind of be like, well, what do I care if someone on Twitter says something dumb, whereas yeah. if you can do your job the way you want to and you don't have to worry about anything but doing your job, that's yeah. better, right? Yeah, the funnier one, I will say, it'll be like someone who is like 18, like in college or something, and they'll be like, oh, like it's so nice to be interviewed by you. And then like you're done, you have like a DM from them. It's like, you are 18 years old. You know what I mean? Like that, that is, I will say definitely is a thing that happens but it's never really like the older people it's these young guys and they'll be like i you know how to shoot my shot it's like calm down <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah these are taylor these are things i have not had in my career <laughs> yeah. yeah no one shooting the shot no dms hey i feel you let's let's trade let's switch <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what we should do. I should respond to your DMs the next time you. That's get your me. next segment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That would be fun for sure. Do you ever get, do you ever get like uh, like a, a, a wrong phone number text? Like I got a text a few years back from a guy in a bathroom who was like holding up his shirt up and it was something like impressed. And I was like, Oh man, there's so many jokes. How do I respond to this? And I think no way. I think I like tried to string it out as long as I could. I was like, oh, you know I'm impressed. <laughs> what else do you got? And then I think I was like too aggressive. And then the, the person just he never realized like it. that's not like, yeah, this is not the person. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely have had some like unwanted, unsolicited things in my DMs. I will say that. <laughs> yeah. Um so with these with these relationships you've built, whether it's a BTN or an SNY or Turner or Bleacher, has there been like this? It's sort of hard to sing out like a best answer, but there's there been an answer where either it cracked you up or it shocked you, or like was there ever a time that you remember like I just this is a moment that I'm in the middle of talking. Yeah. Oh, I mean. The one that I always point to is my interview with DeMar DeRozan, just because I was interviewing him when, you know, he was no longer on the Raptors. The Raptors were in the Eastern Conference Finals. They were, everyone was like, okay, they're probably going to win it all. And so DeMar is having to watch his old team be able to get there with a new person and they couldn't get there with him. And so I was interviewing him in the thick of that and he was just so honest and real and was like you know taylor i've never said this to anybody but i was a sacrificial lamb like I, if it wasn't for me like they want to be there and then i went to one of the finals games and there was a sign that said damar is a sacrificial lamb and i was like that was really cool that that came like from my interview yeah like and people were like two people had seen the sign too and they're like tweeting it to me and i was like it's cool that something that happened in your interview became like a moment yeah. um 
so that one always sticks out to me. And that interview also is super special to me because I feel like it was some of my best work in the show. And that was the first time I had ever met Damar. And you know, it's, I think it's easier to have an interview with somebody you're comfortable with and you know it's much harder when like you are for the first time saying, listen, I need you to be super open and honest and you know, and spill your heart out um, to this person that you don't even know. But it worked that way and he was great. And that's still like my, my absolute favorite one. I think it had so many just like newsworthy moments. There were so many times in the interview where he said, I've never said this. And like, that's, that's what you want somebody to say, you know, when you're interviewing them. So that one sticks out. I would say for funny things, um, when I was in the bubble, I did this segment with players where we would just play heads up. Sure. And it was so much fun. And the answer that always sticks out to me is I was playing with Kimball Walker and the word that I was, he was trying to get me to guess, or the movie was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, I think. And he goes, uh, you know, like they be on brooms and like Harry Potter. <laughs> oh my God. Like that was his clue. I'm like, there's so it many other, it did work. It did work. But there's so many other things that you could have said to get me to say Harry Potter. Uh, so that one, that was a funny moment that always sticks out. And then really just the bubble in general always sticks out to me just because it was so surreal and crazy. And we were in our own little universe. So, uh, yeah, no, I've been, I've been super fortunate to have some really cool moments and some really, you know, moments that were meaningful to me. I want to get to the bubble in a sec, but uh, while we're on this topic, who was it where their, their clue was like three, six mafia? Oh my gosh, Josh Hart. What, explain Literally. what happened there. <laughs> oh my gosh, I still get on him about this, like, and I will never not get on him about this, so <laughs> I, he was um, trying to get me to say Bone Thugs and Harmony. <laughs> and so he goes, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a song. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, uh, he's like, it's a rapper. Like he was saying all these things. And I'm like, what is he talking about? He goes, three, six, three, six mafia. And I was like, wait. Three Six Mafia, okay. And then he, uh, he was, I go, no, Three Six Mafia is a group. He said, no, Three Six Mafia is a song. And I'm like, no, Three Six Mafia is a group. And he's like, okay, then it's not Three Six Mafia. But so I'm like, okay, maybe he meant to say like, I don't know, like Juicy J or like something like that. And then I look at it and I was like, this is Bone Thugs and Harmony. Like there, there was no correlation between Three Six Mafia and Bone Thugs and Harmony. And he got absolutely killed for it. Uh, it like it was so absurd that I don't even remember exactly what he said. I just know he was wrong. <laughs> he was very wrong. Oh, funny. You you trying to say like Priestess Mafia is not a song. Yeah, it's not, not a song. It is a group. Yeah. And this isn't Three Six Mafia. Like right. above all else. Like above all else. <laughs> uh, there have been some you've you've obviously done a great job with basketball players you've also had an awful lot of good interviews with baseball players and all over the spectrum but you've had some fun entertainers has anyone been more of like a oh i'm interviewing this person than when you had snoop <laughs> no not at all um and that was actually thanks to big to network because the reason i even met snoop was because he did that Flint charity game with like Tom Izzo, you know, and Mo Pete. And so he was like, he'd be silent reporter. And that's when I like met Snoop. And so when I had the idea to do a podcast, I just like had DM Snoop was like, hey, I'm starting a podcast. Would you be down? He's like, yeah. He did it like the next day. And then he did a second interview with me another time. So like, he's super, super helpful. Um, so uh, shout out to Q, shout out to Big Tim for that. But yeah, Snoop, it was wild. The second interview that we did was in his recording studio and he was getting his hair done the entire time. <laughs> so like in true Snoop fashion. So it was, it was cool. But yeah, just because that is like my dad, one of my dad's favorite rappers. So he thought it was really cool when I said I was interviewing Snoop. <laughs> what was he like? So nice, like yeah. so nice, super thoughtful, but also like really knows a lot about sports. You know, it's it's good when you have an entertainer that comes on that really like lives, breathes, and eats the sport. 
he loves basketball. He loves football. He really loves the Lakers. I mean, he just knew everything about everything that we talked about. So it was a fun interview. Didn't he, unless I'm mistaken, didn't after the interview, he tweet out that you did this podcast and then he gave you credit to the wrong television network? Yes, I think he might've said like, <laughs> yes, no, no. So this is the second one. I think I was with SNY. Yeah, yeah. But he still said Big Ten. And I was like, you know what? It's Snoop. I'm retweeting it. Like, I don't care. We'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> They'll know what's going on. <laughs> but he did. You have a super good memory. But yeah, he did. So speaking of good memories, I'd like to hold something over you again. Here we go. <laughs> okay, what? Uh, one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite moments was Super Bowl 50. They announced the musical guests and you were crushed and you were like, Coldplay? Ah, come on. Who wants to hear from Coldplay? And I would like talk to you around the office and I'd be like, Coldplay's not bad. And you're like, no, they're awful. And I was like, yeah. Taylor, you're going to like Coldplay. And you, you were like, no, I am not. And I was like, just give them a shot. There's this one song, Viva La Vida, that's, it's really great. And you're like, not interested, terrible. And this, I think they opened the halftime by playing Viva La Vida and you tweeted out, Say what you want about Coldplay, but this is a great song. <laughs> well, all that means is you were right. <laughs> but no, the thing is, I remember being like, this is so dumb. Why is Coldplay being the performer? And that song came on, I was watching, and then I like kind of started moving. I was like, okay, this is kind of good. But I don't, okay, so I know I'm wrong about this, but for some reason I put like Coldplay with like Nickelback. And then maybe <laughs> it's because they're both bands that are two words, but like in my head, it was kind of like one and the same. Uh, and so I, I didn't even give them a chance, but I'm happy I gave them a chance also because I'm pretty sure that was Beyonce year. Yeah, was it? It might have been. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think they brought out Beyonce and Bruno Mars. I think that yeah, was Coldplay. Right. So, hey, That's they are tough. good. They're good in my book. They're good in my <laughs> book. Anytime you can bring new Beyonce to my screen, I, I, they're good. <laughs> well, I think I, I even I either sent you a text or sent you a tweet about it, and it was something like, huh listen to you. And you just wrote back in all caps, people change. Hey, you got to let people evolve. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. Um, you brought up the bubble a couple of times. I want to ask you like the insanity of what yeah. that must have been like. I mean, from the living situation to somehow trying to work while all that was happening in games with yeah. no fans and like, what on earth was that like? That is, and I keep telling people this easily, the thing I remember the most for my entire career, just because it was- Ahem! Oh, well, it's working with my call, okay. right? Working with Shakita, bubble. Thank you, yeah. thank you, keep going. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was just so unique. Um, actually, it was unique. I'm doing this thing where it's like, you shouldn't say Good. unique or very Good, unique, that's you know? right. It was unique. Um, and it was a first and an only and, I feel like all of us in there are now in this like fraternity, right? Because there were so few of us there. You can only point to so many people in the world to say like, I experienced the bubble. Right. Uh, living in Orlando, going to games, going to practices, getting tested every single day, waking up every morning and doing an app where you have to take your pulse, your temperature, say whether or not you would like to speak to a mental health professional. Like there was all of these things that we just, we experienced all these emotions all together and mm -hmm. It's one of those things. I always think it's really silly when people say, oh, you had to be there to get it. Like, I can't explain it. But I really do not know how to explain the bubble unless you were there. It was it was wild. I think that's a, the right way of, of putting it is there's there's genuinely a few hundred people, maybe a couple thousand. Yeah. Well, who went through that experience. And there's there's I mean, my advice to you, I would seriously say this before you forget, like write down. Yeah every detail because in 10 years you might want to write a book and those things will be fascinating and you'll be so upset at how much you'll forget but like those that chapter of the nba's history is going to be remembered for a long long time 100 percent. and it's like i keep telling people that i'm like there's going to be documentary and books and there's right. only so many people you can call so i'm excited to hopefully be in it but no i i think above all else is you know you want and you're like career to be able to talk about history 
right? And like to have such a firsthand account of something that was super historical, like for all of these games to be happening along with a pandemic and along with all of this like racial injustice that is happening in the country. And you were in a place that was the safest place on earth, literally. Everybody in there was COVID free. You got tested every single day. And then you were also a part of something that has never happened, which is a stoppage of play because of racism. Like, and you were able to ask questions and tell these stories and have these conversations and relay the feelings of the bubble to the outside. Um, I think there's just very few times that you are actually chronicling history up close and personal on a regular basis. Like for 60 days, you know, I was really trying my best to have people that are not in the bubble feel like they were in the bubble. And that was just a, a, a joy of my career and also a big challenge in my career, but something that is just super important to me. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because <clears throat> I wanted to tell you how proud I am of you for the way Thank you. you handled, I mean, listen, I, the way any black person in America handled this past summer and, and seeing what was happening was, it, I, I'll, I, I just quite frankly, I'll never understand it. It's something I can never relate to, but I thought, <clears throat> Specifically, when you would find hatred online, Taylor, the way you would respond to it was powerful, yet calm and moving. Like there was one time someone made sort of a snide remark about <clears throat> kneeling for the anthem and, and said something hateful, and you responded with something. It was like, what I think you meant to say was, while I personally would not have chosen to kneel for the anthem, yeah. Of course, as an American citizen, his right to peacefully protest is within his realm of possibilities. And even though it might not be what I choose to do, I'm yeah. willing to listen to him because we're all Americans. And it was like, there was so much snark from so many people that I follow in my life. And for you to be not even 30 and to have the calmness, I mean, every time I saw you handle something like that, you did it gracefully. And I just Thank want you to know you. how proud I am of you. Oh my God. This was supposed to be a fun podcast, not a crying podcast. No, but thank you so much. That that means a, a lot to me. I think that we have all learned so much um, throughout this year. And I think that in a lot of ways, like what I tell people, like I have been a black woman much longer than I have been a journalist, you know, much longer than I have learned, like love sports. So this is a thing that I have from firsthand experience. And I think it's important when I can give my point of view on things that maybe some people genuinely do not get or understand it's, an, it's important to do that, but also recognize that there are gonna be some people who, not that they are never gonna understand, but that they don't want to even understand. And I try not to let those people, you know, bother me. Cause they used to really bother me. Um, like, how can you not see something that feels like it's so clearly in front of you? Um, but now I'm just like, I'm gonna do my part and I am going to try and tell stories that are, you know, reflective of these people. I wanna make sure that athletes have a voice. I wanna make sure the black athlete has a voice. I wanna make sure women has a voice. And that is the thing that I can control and you can't control other people. So. I just want to control what I can control and try to do it, you know, to the to the best of my ability. Right. Well, I thought you've you've done it very well. You really handled things. Thank you. Well, what would you say was your main, like the way that uh, the black athletes, especially in the NBA, they they seem to have this grasp of their freedom and ability to speak out on those issues in a way that maybe even five years ago, wasn't yeah. as apparent. And, you know, I've heard the theory that when Muhammad Ali passed away, so many of the current athletes looked and saw the way he was remembered and saw how powerful he was by speaking out. And that might have, you know, inspired them when this uh, unfortunate opportunity came up this past yeah. summer. But from your experience, from when you would talk to these athletes, what was your main takeaway from what you heard from them? I mean, mainly they just didn't want to be doing nothing. Yeah. Like a lot of them were just like, listen, I am a black man and these fans care so much about me when I am on the court or on the field. They should really care about my experiences in life. That's the thing that was told to me a lot. Like, don't just care about me as an athlete. And that's the thing that we saw a lot that people who were fans, whenever the athlete wanted to use their voice, they were kind of like, eh, I don't care about that. 
right. you know, I just want you to be scoring touchdowns, putting them on the hoop. And that wasn't sitting right with a lot of athletes. Like, if you're going to love this part of me, I need you to at least understand and hear about all the other parts of me. I think that was really the, the biggest thing. And, you know, I think social media has a lot of negative aspects to it, but it has an abundance of positive aspects as well. And I think athletes have really understood through whether, you know, who they follow or conversations they're having on there, this is a tool that they can use to, you know, elevate that platform. So you're seeing them understand that if they go protest and they post it, more people will see and get it. If somebody loves LeBron James and they see that this is what he believes, they'll try to understand why he believes it. Like all of that, I think is a very important part of it. But at the end of the day, above all else, all these athletes were just tired. I think they were tired of seeing the same thing over and over, tired of seeing somebody, you know, killed by the police, tired of seeing all these hashtags. And they were like, what can we do? And I think a lot of the time in the bubble, they felt super helpless. Like, what is what is the thing that I can do? And I think that's one of the reasons like George Hill decided not to play is because he was like, what else can I do? There's nothing, there's nothing else. I'm, I'm helpless and I want to try and do whatever I can. So it was just, that's the thing I'll remember the most about the bubble, just being at that game, clocks at zero, no one's out there. We like run to the locker room, trying to see if anything goes on. We're sitting outside of the locker room for over four hours, just hoping something happens. And like the communications people were asking if we wanted food and water, like we were out there for so long. And then George Hill and Sterling Brown just come out and deliver this statement. And we're all like, wow, like the NBA stopped and it stopped for three days. Um, and that's something that we've never seen. So it was, it was really, uh, it was really cool. Well, I'm glad that you were there and I'm glad you were able to lend your uh, perspective and to be able to soak it in too. I think that's, that's pretty wonderful. Thank all right, before we go, Taylor, we do before you go, four questions that are unrelated to anything whatsoever. Okay, let's do it. Number one, uh, my wife devours The Bachelor, all the housewives, garbage okay. television. What is your terrible TV show that you love? <laughs> um, actually, during quarantine, I started watching 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> Um, so I can't even call it my terrible TV show anymore because I finished them all. Um, but it was 90 Day Fiance. It's just, it's a ridiculous show. Have you seen it? No, I don't think I will. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but it's such like just a guilty pleasure show. So if she hadn't seen that, which sounds like maybe she has, tell her to watch. <laughs> I'll let her know. I'll let her know. Uh, number two, I'm going to force you to brag here. Give me the coolest phone number you have in yourself. Oh, uh... <laughs> Oh, coolest number. I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, I don't know. I guess Drake. That's pretty good. Yeah, I, I feel I'm seeing if there's a, a better one. No, nah, that's probably the cool Drake, Snoop, what you talked about, who was on the pod. Yeah. Uh, but that that's probably who I'd say. Yeah. That's good. He's mine too. Um, <laughs> number three. Uh, Best part about having Lou Brock as a family member? Ah, um, ah, oh, that's me. so sad. You know, and I, I was saying this to someone the other day too. It's like one thing that I think he showed me, and one thing that I I thought about after his passing is just that is a person who like gave so much to baseball, but like baseball really gave so much to him too. Like one of the things I would think about was like every birthday, we would go to Bush Stadium, he would like throw out the first pitch, but we would do this thing in the suite. And then they would always, the whole, everyone in Bush Stadium would look at our suite and sing happy birthday. Hmm. And he would just be beaming. Like, you knew it was his favorite moment, more than the first pitch, more than being there with all of us. It was just like seeing all these Cardinals fans who cared so deeply about what he did, you know, for the franchise. Um, it just, he was just always so happy when, when he did that. And I keep saying to people, like, obviously, you know, he was a great baseball player. He could steal a base for the best of them, all these things. But baseball was what he was great at. But I don't necessarily think that that was his gift. Yeah. I think his gift was like the way that he made people feel and how much he cared about other people. I remember when he came to Illinois for my graduation, when 
graduation was over and I was trying to find my family, there's just this huge group of people around him. And he took a picture with every single one. And he remembered that like a week before that, I had told him that one of my professors was a big Cardinals fan. She was like, tell your professor to come to a dinner. Hmm. So my professor came to our graduation dinner. That's you know, great. like he was like, you said you had someone in your class who wanted to meet me. So he waited to meet that guy in my class. Like he just cared so much about people. And I was getting so many different tweets of people just talking about interactions they had with him. And it just, it made me feel super warm just because he, that's, I don't think the baseball is the first thing that people think about if they met him. They just think about how kind, uh, how kind of a man that he was. So that was the best part about him. And when we were younger, he would always drive us around in the Hummer if we asked, because he had this <laughs> big red Hummer, like when Hummers were really cool. And he would just drive us around in the neighborhood and the license plates said like, Hall of Fame 85, like it was just a really cool Hummer. And he would, it didn't matter. Once we, me and my cousins did it like 10 times and he didn't care. He would, we'd all get in the car, he'd drive us around. So he was a fun uncle. Oh, that's great. Yeah. All right, final one. You've lived in New York, you've lived in Chicago, settle the pizza debate. Okay. I love them both. Like, I feel like that's like a bad thing to say, but I do genuinely love both styles. It depends on my mood, but. I think I really, 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 really miss like Giordano's. So I think I'm going to go Chicago pizza. Because at this point, if I'm going to eat pizza, it's going to be to really indulge. <laughs> and like that deep dish is like, it's some serious business. So <laughs> I'm going to go Chicago audience, pizza. Well done. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> uh, Taylor, I love you. I'm proud of you. Keep doing your thing. It is so you great to watch you. you. Yeah, you've been awesome. Thank you, uh, Mike. I, I take all the credit for what none of it is mine. Because you of, yeah, I know no, her. You She's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should take all of it. Like truly, I I'm always think about just conversations that we've had. I remember just like calling you when I had questions about, you know, what job I should take and things like that. So I appreciate you always lending your ear and all the advice. If it's never had to be like, hey, they're letting me do an interview. Will you watch? And you would send me like all these notes about what you thought about the interview. And I really tried to soak them all in so i appreciate everything that you have done and i miss you and please tell everybody there that i miss them well i will do that and to be clear those notes were to try to scare you away from the industry <laughs> you're, you're, you're a threat okay you're a threat. <laughs> whatever thank you taylor thank you and bye ross so to recap she still remembers producer ross her friendship with snoop started at a big 10 network event the highlight of her career was reporting from the NBA bubble. And yes, she now knows the best possible way to describe Harry Potter. My thanks to Taylor Rooks for joining me. Heads up that our pal Alex Rue always has great stuff on his Take 10 podcast. Be sure to check that out. But that'll do it for this episode. From the Big Ten Network in Chicago, I'm Mike Hall. We'll see you next week.